With such employment opportunities in the world of clothing design, you'd think that at least the education system would wise up and come out of the cold and damp dark ages and into the warm and knowledgeable 90s in order to prepare today's teens for the ever-changing face of industry. But have they? Like the lecturers and the people in charge at the college and the teachers and everybody, they, they, they basically thought it was like, when I showed them photos and that, and they thought it was good, but they didn't understand it, they just didn't appreciate it. They'd never seen actually anybody do a large piece or a large painting. So basically they, they didn't have a clue as to what was going on. And they just, they just basically didn't know nothing. And, um, and when people don't know nothing, they straight away they put it down because they don't understand it. So that's that's the way they went. Pride, a former writer from West London, successfully managed to combine his aerosol art with his college work, unlike Keane, but with expected opposition. When I left university, you know, like the graffiti scene, as such, to like go to art school. It was a bit of a tough break because I didn't really know on what grounds to actually um, still produce the same sort of creative work. But I found discipline at art school, which I couldn't have found from like, being on the streets, as it were. And it's helped me now, now that I've left, I can use the discipline from the art school to um, maybe make my work a bit more structured as far as graffiti is concerned. Initially, there was like quite a conflict from both sides, you know, um, from the art school point of view, there was, um, the graffiti wasn't really an art form because it had such a negative tag. It was like an uphill struggle for me to sort of, like get my work accepted in the same sort of um, confines as say, watercolour painting or oil colour painting. Yeah, there's a lot of ignorance and prejudice because every time this, like, this whole graph thing gets reported on the news and on the TVs. It's always about people like out doing ruining places, smashing places up, writing on everything in sight. But at the end of the day, like what they've got to realise is people, young kids today ain't got nothing and this gives kids something and this gives people a way out from just like sitting around all day getting out of their faces and not like snorting coke or whatever and you know, it, it gives you a sense of direction a feeling of you're actually somebody and that's what they don't understand because without this there'd be even more people out there like doing drugs all day just wasting away just being normal people just living and dying and just being sad as a writer once said on the subject if you look at the volume of young people who are doing aerosol art now you should take that as a message that people aren't necessarily going to be able to go to art school to produce creative pieces of work yet they're still producing creative pieces of work in their own environment. People shouldn't just see it as vandalism, but maybe as a cry from the heart that people actually want to produce art. With mainstream galleries being the pinnacle of the art establishment pyramid, 95% of writers can't ever hope to get a look in, but many of those that have have done so on the gallery's terms. galleries are one of the many avenues which allowed writers to develop their ideas within the aerosol culture. Much of what was actually done on canvas had nothing to do with what was happening on the trains. This was in part damaging to the culture as it gave a false representation of a powerful youth culture that was forcing people from all walks of life to sit up and take notice. You have the same energy, you have the same colouring, you have the same intensity and the same big piece that you would see on a train. The real subway graffiti that's done on on the trains is slowly dying out and this is taking its place the lifespan of an 
average piece today only lasts a few months. This is something that could last a lifetime. Now, I'm a colorist myself, I'm an artist. And it's exciting, the color is exciting, the movement is exciting, it combines all kinds of movements. We had uh, ABC TV, we had CBS here tonight. You know, we're going to be on the news tonight at right. 11 o'clock, uh, National Public Radio. Uh, Do it up, baby. I'm Ron Powers. I'm a, I'm a reporter with the Associated Press. How long would it take you to do something like that? On a train? Depends what your schedule is. Like. I can't let my mother know that I'm going to the train, so I have to be back early. But I did meet a guy here who's an art critic from the news, and he says he gets so goddamn mad every time he sees this, that he walked up to one of the artists at the show tonight and said, how would you feel if I took a can and wrote on your graffiti? And the... The artist said to him, I kill you, man. As an investment, I feel so strongly that if you get in on the bottom of anything, it's got to be a good investment, and this is definitely going someplace. But uh, I think that uh, graffiti on the subway cars were uh, a symbol of uh, New York for uh, foreign people, and especially French people. And uh, I think it's a little uh, sad if uh, graffiti are going to be only on canvas. Not anymore on trains. Forget about the trains. He wants to be dirty and hot at the same time. That's right. Only to making money. <laughs> yeah, it feels good. You go to you go to school and your teacher says it, it's not worth anything. You don't make any money from graffiti. Yeah, and you tell right. him, when was the last time you made two thousand dollars in a month? Huh? From the late seventies and right through the eighties, writers or ex-writers had gallery shows and exhibitions all over the world. In New York, Paris, Amsterdam, Berlin, Milan, Switzerland, Spain, and even Japan, with canvases selling from $1,000 up to over $30,000. In the elitist art establishment, nothing ever happens by chance, and it was the same level of schematic gameplay that manipulated the scene into deciding who was going to represent the culture and how. Puerto Ricans and other light-skinned Nubians were mainly selected because their so-called ethnic look fitted the bill, i.e. creative youths from the ghetto, while at the same time not having them look too threatening, leaving the darker-skinned Nubians out in the cold simply because, as one writer put it, their freckles were too close together. This level of racism has always existed within the hierarchy of Western art and influence, with some of the best examples being the way ancient Egyptians are always portrayed as being light-skinned or akin to Europeans, when the facts show otherwise, and also the way the influence of Nubian face masks and sculptures from Africa on the work of Matisse and Picasso has been whitewashed out of most of the history books. These two great artists were just imitating what they saw, yet no recognition or credit has ever openly being given to the originators. Even in the 90s, the term graffiti artist still gets some purists up in arms over the definition of art. The West Soho Gallery thinks it's time that graffiti is given its rightful status in the art world and is hosting one of London's first spray can art exhibitions by the Parisian artist Cam. Is London ready? This was another media lie. This exhibition took place in 1993, whereas the first exhibition of aerosol culture took place eight years previously, back in 1985. Even the standard of paintings produced by Cam wasn't as good as the illegal paintings done on London streets back in 1985, let alone any of that era's canvas work. Yet because he was from Paris, preference was given to him, and the wealth of aerosol talent London and the rest of Britain had to offer wasn't even remotely considered. There have also been many other instances where London's writers have been routinely shunned by the media, art establishment or advertising agencies in favour of some American or even European writers. Everywhere on the car, big car, van, subway, street. I got in trouble with this family. And police. So it didn't, didn't have to shake my heart. They don't lie. Everybody. I'm stuck by tagging right on the wall, like a, on the train, everywhere on the car, big car, van, subway, street. I got in trouble with this family and police. So it didn't, didn't have to shake my heart. They don't lie. Everybody. 
what we're gonna do right here is go back way back back into time we rock and don't stop when it's a super cat the battleistic and the other shows and physical things that tell back and fish is the way we get our cake we're qualified and rectified and rock it till the day we're dying every time you're screaming crying we're here with no denying we hold the honor and our pride take the steps that can't be fine and now who's your will of mine we're gonna take it for a ride before we rock it that's a full of super juice from my one let's do okay, on the play I'm rocking for the USA and this is how I rock them out I do it to you every time remember me and Fimo D the man that's at the T.O.P. a spoonie G as you can see I rock the West Society and at the end you will agree nobody rock the mic like me but let's do case of time I'll do your ad as I will equal three and on the mic we turn it out and your latest mic was out of doubt and if you don't believe it's you to check out how we rock for you and if you don't believe it's you just check out how we rock for you and if you don't believe it's you to check out how we rock for you Don't miss that. 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 Don